Hello and happy Douglas week, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you, everyone joining us on YouTube today. Thank you for being here with us for this third Douglas week. We have more than 40 events planned for you all this um, year, and we're delighted that you're here to join us for this one, the special one. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. First of all, I'm uh, Dr. Caroline Dunham Schroeder. I'm the founder of Douglas Week, and I'm really happy to be here with you all for this event. And I'm here joined by co founder, collaborator, and my friend, um, Kristen Leary, uh, and uh, our wonderful guest speaker today, John Muller, who is a repeat contributor to Douglas Week. Isn't that right, Kristen? Yes, he is. Thank you, John. We're really glad that you can join us again this year. Um, John is in Washington, D.C. And has, uh, as Caroline mentioned, yeah, he's been he's been with us the last two years as well. So we're really at both virtually and in person, um, uh, giving us behind the scenes and unusual tours of Washington D.C. So John, again, thank you from all of us on the Douglas Week team for for being here again this year. Um, just a little bit about John. He is the author of Frederick Douglass in Washington D.C. The Lion of Anacostia came out in 2012 or sorry uh, yeah 2012 sorry uh and mark and another book is mark twain in washington dc the adventures of a capital correspondent which came out the following year uh john has also presented widely throughout the dc baltimore metro area at venues including the library of congress the pratt library dc public library frederick Douglass national historic site and local universities and as I mentioned, I've been fortunate enough to join John on uh, Frederick Douglass walking tour, which he leads quite regularly in Washington, D.C., as well as in Baltimore, Harper's Ferry, and other places. And we hope you enjoy this Douglas Week event with John Muller. And if you like this one, we are sure that you will love our other more than 40 events we have planned this year please check out our website at douglasweek.org and follow us on social media to learn more. And now over to John. Thanks again, John. Right, wonderful. Thank you for having me, Kristen and Carolyn. Uh, let me share my screen here. Can you guys see that? That's wonderful. We, Thank you, John. We can see it. Thanks. Okay, great. Now, now in the interest of time, this is going to be a little bit of an abbreviated presentation. So the theme is Rochesterians in Cedar Hill, educators, journalists, and activists visit Frederick Douglass in Washington, DC. And the title could actually be amended to be Rochesterians and Brockportonians, which is some know Brockport is in Monroe County. So it really could almost be Monroe Countyans in Cedar Hill. Whereas the theme of this is that there were several um, several close friends and associates of Frederick Douglass's time in Rochester who came to Washington uh, for extended periods of time and stayed with him and the Douglass family. And Frederick Douglass, whereas many of these friends from Rochester, he knew several generations and they in return knew several generations of Douglass's family uh, and grandchildren. So I will just get into this with no further delay. Uh, in 1872, Frederick Douglass, after establishing a newspaper in Washington City in 1870, purchased a family homestead in the Capitol Hill neighborhood of Washington City after a devastating fire destroyed the Douglass homestead in Rochester. In 1877, Frederick Douglass acquired the present-day site of the National Park, the, the present-day site of the National Park Service unit, the Frederick Douglass National Historic Site, which is where Douglass passed away in 1895. During this last quarter century of his life, Frederick Douglass maintained an active correspondence with his friends in Rochester, and these friends often visited him in Washington City, staying with the Douglass family while in the nation's capital. Uh, so, in fact, the, the Rochesterian friends of Frederick Douglass stayed at his capital home, at his Capitol Hill home, as well as then when Douglass relocated from Capitol Hill to Uniontown, today Anacostia, uh, members, uh, 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 friends of his from Rochester stayed with him at Cedar Hill. So Douglas had uh, maintained these connections and associations and relationships with Rochesterians. And for example, there was a gentleman uh, who managed his investment properties in Rochester and frequently uh, would come down to Washington to visit him. 
Uh, and I actually don't get into that, gentlemen, because there's there's so many different contexts and friends that this presentation is just a quick look at a couple uh, of these individuals. All right. Visitors from Rochester to the Douglas family homestead were various and numerous. Many of these visitors from Monroe County, New York, and other areas of Western New York were generational allies and colleagues of Frederick Douglass and his family. Guests were from the ranks of veterans of the Union Army, journalists, including Jane Marsh Parker, suffragists, most notably Susan B. Anthony, educators and activists, including Fanny Barrier Williams. Many friends from Rochester and Brockport stayed with the Douglas family for extended periods of time, speaking to the feeling of goodwill that existed between Frederick Douglass and his friends in Rochester, New York. To the bottom left of your screen is Frederick Douglass's home on Capitol Hill. And on the top is Frederick Douglass's home in Cedar Hill. I know that there is a lot of conversation and it's been a lot of conversation for now more than a decade or so about Frederick Douglass and photographs. Maybe somewhere in the attic of some of our friends in Rochester, there are maybe some family photos of friends who came down to Rochester and stayed with Frederick Douglass and took photos uh, that have never been made public. So maybe some of our friends in Rochester can dig in the attic and maybe find some of these potentially lost photographs. All right. So Brockport, Tonian, Washingtonians at Cedar Hill. Uh, these are two young ladies who Frederick Douglass closely worked with, who I'll get into uh, later on in the presentation. And we must um, consider that Frederick Douglass is when he's in and in Washington, it's his last 25 years of his life. And in the 1890s, he's in his uh, in the twilight years. He's in his late 70s. And so many of these Rochester friends knew Frederick Douglass, but also his children and grandchildren. And in fact, many of these uh, individuals who stayed with Frederick Douglass, they were essentially being sent to Frederick Douglass's home by their parents and or grandparents who Frederick Douglass had known in the 1840s and 1850s. So I think it's it's really important to stress kind of the um the 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 tr the sense of trust, the sense of goodwill, the sense of friendship whereas Frederick Douglass had known uh these these two women uh that are featured on the left and right. I believe that Frederick Douglass knew them since they were young children. So it, biographers have really not get gotten into that they continue to just pedal in mythology and the same old same old same old and we really have yet to get into the depth and dynamic of uh not only just frederick Douglass but his family and his working relationships with these individuals and fanny barrier williams lived until i believe the 40s or 50s and miss page on the left lived to the 1960s so the impact of frederick Douglass on some of these younger people lasted well into uh, the, the modern civil rights era. All right. So Frederick Douglass runs the new national era, launches in Washington, D.C. If you lived in Brockport, New York, between 1870 and 1874, you'd go to Anthony J. Barrier. Anthony J. Barrier was a subscription agent for the new national era. And he was the father of Fanny Barrier Williams, who is on your right. And just for the brevity of this presentation, I'm not going to get into all of the correspondence between Anthony Barrier and Mr. Douglas, but um, yes, Mr. Barrier was a trusted ally of Frederick Douglass. And so when he launches this newspaper in Washington, D.C., many of the subscription agents for the uh, the North Star then help to disseminate and distribute this newspaper in their local communities. All right, this is just earlier we talked about um, Douglas's home on Capitol Hill, where many of his friends from Rochester uh, stayed while visiting Washington. All right, so Brockport, New York. It's a uh, small little burgeoning town um, along the Erie Canal, and this was the home of the Barrier and Page families. Actually, in the Brockport Cemetery, there are several individuals that knew and worked alongside Frederick Douglass. And as of a couple of years ago, I did not know that there were any historic markers in Brockport, New York, um, uh, recognizing and uplifting the history and connections of Frederick Douglass to the community. But we do have this building, which is a little more modern. This is, I believe, an 1871 building that used to be an opera house. 
and you'll see on the third floor, there's a gentleman kind of looking out onto the street. And that is, in fact, the likeness of Frederick Douglass, who I believe gave lectures on at least two different occasions in this building. So it's also important to communicate that when Frederick Douglass is living in Washington, D.C., he makes several visits uh, back to Monroe County, to Rochester. Uh, he attends due to um, family reasons. Uh, he actually attends some baseball games in Monroe County. And so he maintained um, a continuous relationship um, with uh, the institutions and individuals that had been uh, very important to him um, in the years leading up to the Civil War. All right, and this is just a close-up of uh, Mr. Douglas's likeness there. All right, and this is just a little... Um, map of Brockport, New York and Monroe County, which I mentioned was home to the Barrier and Page families. And if you'll look on your map, on the bottom left, hair cutting and shaving salons, Anthony J. Barrier. Anthony J. Barrier was the father of Fanny Barrier Williams. Fanny Barrier Williams was the first uh, black woman to attend what is today SUNY Brockport, which back then it was the Brockport Normal College similar to like um, Miners Teachers College or Minor Normal School in Washington, D.C. All right. Um, so this was the newspaper I mentioned, Mr. Barrier to the bottom left. He distributed the new national era in his barbershop in Brockport, New York. All right, Miss Fanny Barry Williams was born in Monroe County, New York in 1880. Her father, Anthony Barry, was an associate of Frederick Douglass in Brockport, New York for decades. The Williams uh, and Douglas families were closely associated in both Monroe County, New York and Washington City in circles of education and activism. For those of you who are familiar with Frederick Douglass and the uh, Columbia Exposition in 1893, you know that Frederick Douglass personally employed uh, many individuals kind of as his recording secretaries, one being Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Fanny Barrier Williams also helped Mr. Douglass at the uh, Columbia Exposition in 1893 in Chicago. And another famous lady who uh, kind of worked in the Frederick Douglass uh, tent was Ida Wells at that time. So Fanny, Bar Fanny Barrier Williams, although not yet 30 years old, uh, was was running with a pretty inf what would be a pretty influential uh, crowd at the time. And it is my understanding that uh, Fanny Berry Williams knew Mr. Douglas since she was in diapers. Here is a mural on the side of the Brockport Diner in the burgeoning metropolis of Brockport. And there represented is Fanny Barrier Williams. All right, so it's just a little bit more. Fanny Barry Williams was born in Brockport, New York. Uh, she was highly educated. Uh, she first came into public notice during the World's Columbian Exposition. Uh, and she was a noted uh, journalist, activist, suffragist, kind of in the same class of Mary Church Terrell and some of these leading um, kind of socially active uh, black women in the early 1900s that were involved in several different uh, local, national, state organizations and um, yes, yeah, so she actually, Miss w uh, Fanny Barrier Williams, stayed uh, at Cedar Hill for uh, extended periods of time um, before Mr. Douglas passed away. And then also these women were uh, friendly with Frederick Douglass's first wife and also his second wife. And Fanny Barrier Williams actually stayed at uh, Cedar Hill um, following Mr. Douglas's passing. And so she was friends and worked alongside um, Helen Fitz Douglas. All right, Jane Marsh Parker, as you can see here, uh, she might not have been uh, a spokesperson for PETA, but nonetheless, she was friends with Mr. Douglas. You can see here, she's got some sort of very fine uh, fur coat on here. Parker and her family were lifelong friends with the Douglas family in life and afterlife, and they are neighbors to the Douglas family in Mount Hope Cemetery in Rochester, New York, which I'm sure many people listening in Rochester or tuning in are familiar with that uh, Victorian cemetery. Jane Marsh Parker visited Frederick Douglass and his family on several occasions following Frederick Douglass's settling in Washington City uh, on Capitol Hill and Old Anacostia. Before Douglass's departure for his grand tour of 1886-1887, Jane Marsh Parker visited Douglass and his family and wrote an insightful 
um, newspaper profile that was syndicated in newspapers across the country. Won't get into all the details of that newspaper profile, but Miss Parker, um, she really knew Mr. Douglas well to the point where she comments on, for example, his favorite meal and essentially says that if Mr. Douglas passed with his own hand one of his favorite Maryland beaten biscuits to you that you knew that um, you know, he was being very friendly towards you and extending his um, most gracious hospitality. And Miss Parker shared se shared several meals uh, with Mr. Douglas in Washington, in Rochester. And um, Parker is a pretty interesting lady, kind of in the same class of Emily Edson Briggs, Mary Clemmer, Clemmer Ames. These were kind of Washington correspondents. Miss uh, Miss Parker um, stayed in Rochester and wrote several groundbreaking local uh, history pe history pieces on Rochester and in her own right was a very influential local historian. All right, Mr. William Page. William Page was born into slavery in 1834 in Florida. He reportedly somehow arrived in Western New York via the Underground Railroad <coughs> before the Civil War. Page developed a coal business along the Erie Canal of Brockport, New York, supplying coal to residential and commercial customers. He was a lifelong friend of Frederick Douglass, um, and they worked alongside each other in Monroe County in upstate New York in terms of what were early um, convention movements, um, kind of petitioning uh, the New York state government for um, political rights. And Mr. Page had the property requirements that enabled him to vote in New York State prior to the Civil War. Um, all right, and I'm actually jumping around a little bit because I meant to get into his daughter. So Mr. William Page's daughter, Florence Gertrude Page, interesting lady. From Brockport, New York, she attended Howard University in Washington City, right along George Avenue. This is the Howard University student catalog from March 1894 to March 1895. You can see under Page, <coughs> Gertrude Page, Brockport, New York. She was delineated as a special student. Why was she a special student? Because she was um, essentially studying fashion and or seamstressy, or so seamstress work similar to Elizabeth Keckley who was on the faculty of Wilberforce University in Ohio. Miss Keckley was the dressmaker for none other than Mary Todd Lincoln. So on the board of trustees of Howard University from 1872 until his death in 1895, you'll see Honorable Frederick Douglass, Washington, D.C. And here is a close-up of Miss Page. In her mid-20s, Florence Gertrude Page was a special student at Howard University in the 1894-1895 academic year. This was the last year in which Frederick Douglass served on the Board of Trustees. His board service uh, ended with his passing. Miss Page was studying seamstressing, dressmaking within the fledgling, fledgling industrial education mechanical arts department. As the very, very few select group of Frederick Douglass and higher education scholars know, Frederick Douglass was an advocate for industrial education, AKA the mechanical arts. Today would be known as vocational training. So while Frederick Douglass advocated for the liberal arts, kind of traditional humanities and advocated for Howard University's law school, its medical department, he also advocated that the university expand into teaching blacksmithing, carpentry, and even, for example, dressmaking. There are documentation to show that Miss Page was kind of like a, a tailor to Frederick Douglass's children. It is my belief that Frederick Douglass helped to introduce Miss Page to an elite clientele in Washington, D.C. Some of you know who are tuning in from Brockport, New York, Miss Page actually left Washington, D.C., Settled, went back to Brockport, New York, and was a successful business owner for decades. And upon her death, left uh, money to several churches in Brockport. And there's a lot more on Miss Page, which I won't get into, other than um, essentially Miss Miss Page was um, the, was at Cedar Hill 
the night that Frederick Douglass passed away. No biographers, uh, including those who I, um, including those who I really admire, um, no biographers have gotten into Miss Page, and she gives a very interesting account several decades after the fact of essentially being in and around um, the family and at Cedar Hill in the immediate wake of Frederick Douglass's passing. And she was at Fred, she was at Cedar Hill because she was a very trusted, almost kind of like an extended member of the Frederick Douglass family. All right. So Douglass had a lot of connections to Rochesterians, including this gentleman. On February 20, 1878, excuse me, United States Congressman from Wisconsin, Charles G. Williams, who had lived in Rochester during the years that Douglas called the city home, revealed an insight into his relationship with his friend, the United States Marshal for the District of Columbia. So Mr. Williams attended the University of Rochester. Douglas maintained incredible contacts with the University of Rochester, with the University of Rochester, I don't think is very aware of, unfortunately. So this gentleman was an alumni of the University of Rochester, served in the United States Congress during Reconstruction, and read into the congressional record an insight into his personal friendly relationship with Frederick Douglass. Congressman Williams says, quote, reading of this infectious feeling in that office, I was reminded of an ironical remark which I heard Mr. Frederick Douglass make some years ago. He said he could never account for it, but somehow whenever he got in sight of the dome of the Capitol in Washington, he always felt as though he wanted to steal something. I do not believe Frederick Douglass was a kleptomaniac. I do not believe Frederick Douglass was someone who uh, endorsed or supported criminal behavior. I believe this is kind of Frederick Douglass making a satirical kind of remark on the nature of politics in Washington. This is made in the in the period of the Gilded Age during uh, there was kind of corruption going on in Washington in the Grant administration. There was a lot of accusations against Senator uh, Blaine, the Speaker of the House Blaine. And um, Frederick Douglass is also commenting on where the Capitol Dome had represented life, liberty, and happiness pursuit of happiness for kind of white Americans leading up to the Civil War, whereas, and it represented in uh, bondage and enslavement for Douglas's four million brothers and sisters leading up to the Civil War. So Douglas is kind of making a comment on the symbolism of the Capitol. The thing is very revealing where he make, he, he gives, he shares this joke with a friend of his from Rochester, which under underlies the sense of camaraderie and goodwill that Douglas had with his friends from Rochester and although Douglas was away from Rochester, he still felt connected to Rochester through these friends of his who he could contact and collaborate with in Washington. All right, that is an extremely abbreviated presentation. Uh, for those of you who would like to get in contact, uh, there is an email. There's more information about Lost History Tours. Um, you can also find me on Twitter. I don't believe we're doing this um, with a question and answer session. So I just wanted to thank Kristen uh, and Car uh, Caroline and everyone who has helped to put together Douglas Week this year. I appreciate everyone tuning in. And thank you again for tuning into Douglas Week 2023. And we hope to see you later on in the week and next year.